Okay. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> this is a seventh session, and today we'll discuss uh, the questions similar to the final assignment, assignment number eight. So uh, the first question here is. In a drug discovery study, the effect of drug X on the cell death is given below, developed by linear regression relation. So we are given uh, the drug amount that is 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, and 40, and the percentage of cells that have died 10, 14, 18, 22, 26, and 34. Uh, just one second. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so the first question here is based on the data in table one. What is the slope of the relation? So for uh, linear regression, uh, if we are given data points X and Y, and we know the number of data points that is n, then we can use this formula to calculate the slope of the lin linear regression. So first, what we'll do is like, we know that the drug amount is x, and the cell death is the uh, y value. So x is the independent variable, and y is the dependent variable. So here we need summation of x, y, summation of x, summation of y, summation of x square, and summation of x. So what we'll do first is we'll calculate x, y for each of these points. So x, y is nothing but 30 into 10, which is 300, 32 into 14, which is 448, and so on. x square is 30 square, 932 square, 1024, and so on. And we'll find the sum of all of these values. So this here represents sum of x square, a eh, sum of x, sorry. This represents sum of y. This is summation of x, y, and this final row is summation of x, y. So now what we'll do is we'll put it up in this formula. So slope is given by h, and n here is the number of data points. So we have in total 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 data points. So n here will be 6. Okay, so we'll put 6 in a row. Summation of x, y, which is 4,500 minus summation of x, which is 210 into summation of y, which is 124 divided by 6 into summation of x square, which is 7,420 minus summation of x whole square, which is 210 whole square. And after solving this equation, we find out that the slope here comes out to be 2.285, 2.286, if I hold it off. Is that clear? Yes. 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 So, similarly, based on the data in table one, what is the intercept of the relation? Intercept now is given, given by the uh, equation summation of y minus m into summation of x divided by n. So from the previous question here, we have the values for summation of x and summation of y, which is 210 and 124. So summation of x is 210, summation of y is 124. And here is again 6, the number of data points. m is the slope that we have calculated in the previous question. Which is 2.285. Okay. So we have the slope of the relation. So we substitute all these values and we'll get the value of intercept, which comes out to be minus 59.33. So this equation here will become is equal to 124 minus 2.285 into 210 by 6. Which will turn out to be minus 59.33. Is that clear? 
Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Based on the data in table one, what is the R square value? Okay. So R square value is given by one minus sum of the residuals of regression divided by total sum of squares. So what we do here is so to find the total sum of squares, what we'll do is we'll take each point of y and we'll subtract it by the mean. So in this case, the y bar is given as the mean, which is summation of all y divided by n, which is 6. So here it turns out to be 20.667. Then what we'll do is we'll subtract all of these y values that were given in the table. So here 10, 14, 18, 22, 26 and all. So we'll subtract that from the mean, which is 20. So we'll get all these values. And then we'll square these values to get the sum of squares. And then for this column, we'll find the total sum, which is the total sum of squares. Is the total sum of squares. Similarly, so we have we now have an equation of the line. So we have the slope. So our equation of line looks something like this: y is equal to mx plus d where M is the slope that we have calculated as 2.285 and B is the intercept that we calculated as minus 59.33. So putting the value of X in all of these, so the value of X that is 30, 32, 34 and all for all these data points, what we'll do is we'll put the value of X here in this equation and get a value of Y. That is the predicted value of Y. So for each of these points, we'll have a predicted value of y based on the linear regression equation. Then what we'll do is we'll subtract the value of actual value of y from the predicted value of y to get uh, this difference. This is called the residuals and or the difference rate, uh, regression difference. Then we'll sum uh, square of, uh, take the square of all of these. So this will be 0 0.76 square, which is 0 0.58, and 0 0.19 square, which is 0 0.036, and so on. And these sums, uh, these squares, will sum to get the uh, sum squared regression or the sum square of residuals. Then we'll substitute it in this equation, and our R square value will turn out to be 1 minus 7. 619 divided by 373.33, which turns out to be 0.9795. Is this clear? Hello? Yes, it is clear. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Then uh, next we need to calculate what is the R square adjusted. So R square adjust, adjusted, what it does is, so R square, uh, here the R square that we calculated, it's the R square value like for goodness of fit of the whole model. It does not take into account like the model parameters or stuff like that. It can be used for any model without any change into the formula. But R square adjusted, what it does it is takes into account the number of data points that you have and also the number of parameters that are there into your model. So it punishes your model if it has too many, uh, if it has too many parameters to get a good R square value. So the formula here is given by one minus one minus R square into n minus one by n minus p, where n is the number of data points. Which in this case is six and p is the number of parameters in our model. For our linear regression model, our equation is y is equal to mx plus b. So we have two parameters, that is m and b. So here the number of parameters, which is p, turns out to be two. So substituting all that, we get our just our square value to be 0 0.9744. So this equation becomes one minus one minus uh, the square value, which was the nine seven nine place. into 6 minus 1, which is 5, divided by 6 minus 2, which is 4. So following this equation, we get the value for 
ask a register which is 0.97 ask a registered value will always be lower than the uh, actual ask a value is that clear hello yes yes sir yes yeah. Then we need to calculate what is the aspect predicted. OK, so we are given all the values for X and Y, these two columns. The aspect predicted value is given as 1 minus sum of predictive residual squares divided by total sum of squares. So predictive residual squares. So for uh, calculating the aspect, what we did was we fit a model to the whole data and then we calculated the difference between the residuals for the whole model, and then we use that to calculate the sum of residual squares. But in this case, what we'll do is for each point, that is for point one, we'll first leave out this point, we'll fit a model to these four points. Then we'll try to predict the value of y at x is equal to 30. Okay, so we'll get a single model by fitting these four values. Then we'll try to predict the fifth value from this and then compare that predicted value to the actual y value that we have here. So. First, what we do is. For this case, or the case number one, what we'll do is we'll leave out this point 30 and 10. We'll fit a model to this four points 32, 34, 36, 38, 14, 18, 22, 26, and then we'll get an equation like this. For the first model. Then we'll put the value of x as 30 here to get the predicted value from the new model, the y predicted value, which will be 8.4. Then we'll find the difference between this value and the actual y value, which turns out to be 1.6. We'll square it, which is 2.56. And similarly, we'll do that for all these rows. So for the second case, what we'll do is we'll take this point this point, this point, and this point. Four of these points will fit an equation. The equation will look like this. Then we'll put the value of x as 32. Then we'll get this predicted value from this equation. And then we'll again calculate the difference from this to the actual value and then square it. And all of these squares will add to get the sum of square of predicted residuals. So sum of squares of residuals of predicted values. Then what we'll do is the total sum of squares that we got in the last time was 373.33. So the formula turns out to 1 minus 24.879 divided by paper. Yeah. 373.33. So this value will turn out to be 0.933. Is that clear? Okay, last so, column is calculated new model equations. Yeah, so when we had all of these values, these we have these five values, no? One, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, six values. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. So first to do the linear regression, we fit the model to all six values, right? Mm. Then we got a slope and intercept. That was 2.28 and intercept was minus 59. Right. Huh. In this case, what we'll do is to calculate the equation for the first data point. OK, what we'll do is we'll use points 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. We'll fit a model. And this model equation will turn out to be this, which will be 2.4x. So we'll repeat basically whatever we did for the first two questions. Again, by leaving out this point. Then what we'll do is after that to get this value, we'll put x is equal to 30, which is the value of x in point one. x is equal to 30. Using this equation and x equal to 30, we'll get this value. And then we'll again calculate the residuals and sum the squares of the residuals. So for similarly, for if we want to find the equation for point number two, what we'll do is we'll take points one, three, four, five, six. 
all these five points will take. We'll fit another model. And then we'll get another equation. So basically, we must calculate slope and intercept excluding one value. Mm. Yeah, excluding okay. one value. You yes. do the calculations. Uh -huh. Then that for that value, you will calculate the predicted uh, y value. Yes. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. The next question is how many degrees of freedom for error? So as we know, our linear regression equation is y is equal to mx plus b. So we have number of parameters here is two. The total number of data points that we had again is equal to six. So the degrees of freedom that we'll have will be n minus p, which is six minus two, which is two. So these will be the degrees of freedom for error. So in total, we have six degrees of freedom because we have six data points. But two of the degrees of freedom we are utilizing to build a model. Left over, we have four degrees of freedom, which will be assigned for the error. Is that clear? Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah. The question here is, what is the total sum of squares? Again, like for total sum of squares, what you do is you take y i and you subtract it from y bar and you sum it up for all the values. Once you square it and sum it up. So by doing that, we will get table values. So we took the y bar, which was 20.6. We subtracted all the y values, squared them up, and then summed it up to get the total sum of squares, which in this case is 373.333. Is that clear? Yes. If a factorial design, does a design generator has f is equal to a, b, c, d, e? What is the resolution of this design? So we are given the design f is equal to a, b, c, d, e. So the generator here will be, generator equation will be f, a, b, c, d, e. The generator equation has six terms f a b c d e so the resolution of this design will be six is that clear yes 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 yeah how many experiments do we have to perform so since we are using a base design of like five experimental design and we are assigning a new factor so this basically turns out to be 2 to the power 5 minus 1, a half factorial of 5 factor uh, experiments, which turns out to be 2 to the power 4. So the total number of experiments we'll have to perform will be 16. Since we have 5 independent factors, A, B, C, D, E, and the 6th factor, we are allocating it to the interaction term. So in total, we have 5 minus 1 design. Is this clear? Yes. Yeah. So again, this is a total by n minus five, where n is equal to five, as we saw here. N is equal to five. Is that clear? Yes. Yes. Next question is: A factory is making switches. Every week, eight samples are taken and the number of defects are determined and listed as given below for 10 weeks in order to prepare our species chart. So these are the values that we are given 4, 5, 6, 3, 8, 2, 6, 4, 5, 3, 4. The question here is if you want to draw an SPC chart, what type of chart will we draw? So there are these different kinds of charts, body and chart, C chart, P e chart, and P chart. Uh, is someone asking something? Hello. Okay. So we have these different kinds of charts called U chart, C chart, P chart, and P chart. The answer here will be C chart because every week we are taking the number of defects 
number of defective pieces. And every week we have a constant number of samples. Which in this case is eight. So every week we are taking eight samples and we are calculating the number of defects. That's why this is a C chart. If we had, uh, if you have been calculating the number of defects, like number of defective pieces, but we had a uh, differing number of samples, the num we calculate number of defective pieces, but we had differing number of samples each week. Then we would have a U chart. For P chart, what we do is we calculate the proportion of defective pieces. pieces not the number of defective pieces. And here, like the number of samples, I think, changes. Number of samples changes week to week, can change, like not changes. If we have constant number of samples in P design, then we have what is called a NP chart. So these are basically the four kinds of charts. C chart means we are counting the number of defective pieces and our sample size every week is constant. In this case, uh, in this example, that is the case. So we have eight samples every week. And we're calculating the number of defects from them. So this is a C chart kind of a SPC chart. For U chart, we also calculate the number of defective pieces, but the number of samples can differ each week. For P chart, we calculate the proportion of defective pieces and the number of samples can change every week. If the number of samples are kept constant every week and we calculate the proportion of defective pieces, then we have what is called a NP chart. Is this clear? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Last question is given the data for number of defects every week, this indicates the process is indeterminate, the process is in control, the process is not in control, cannot exactly indicate if it is in control. So we'll plot all the data that we have. So if this here is the time, and this here is the number of defective pieces. that we have. We calculate the mean of the data, which comes out to be 4.2, somewhere around here, the mean of the data. <laughs> then we calculate the standard deviation. And so the there are two control limits that we have in process control charts. charts. So the lower control limit is given by mean minus three standard deviations, which is somewhere around 0.25. Somewhere around here will be our lower control limit. And somewhere around here, 8.14, which is 2 plus 3 signal, will be our upper control limit. Since in this plot, we see that uh, the number of defects kind of randomly changes between the mean, does not fall into one side always, or like does not go beyond the control limits. We can say that the process still is in control. Uh, the, answer, right. yeah, the process is in control. So in one of the videos, I think the last video, Sarah mm -hmm. said a number of different rules that we had to check for to see so if the process is not of total, control. Arpit, by total seven rules uh, specified in that particular video. So mm -hmm. such type here mm -hmm. the, in our mm -hmm. assignment also a very easy question actually but if a multiple data set is provided uh, mm -hmm. just like a chart in the exam so all mm -hmm. seven rules need to be considered am i right yeah okay yeah if you are given a long set of data all set of rules should be considered 
So the rules vary from like if uh, a point is very high above the control limit or if there are three points in zone A, zone B and stuff like that. So zone A is I think the closest group here between one sigma. Between the uh, like one sigma above and below the mean, two sigma above and below the mean is called zone B. And I think this part is called the zone C. So like based on the number of points, consecutive points in a certain zone, or like the number of points in on each side of the mean. So for example, if your data fluctuates a lot, so if, for example, if you had data like this, then this, then this, then this, so it would alternate a lot. That would mean that a process is out of control. There is some error in the mechanism that we have to probe and find out. So all of these rules are there in one of those videos. You can check that video. Uh, try to remember all the rules and then check for it while you solve the questions. Okay. Yeah. So that was it. So do you guys have any issues with any of the questions? Can you please go on the question number one, please? Yeah. Uh, because actually we calculated uh, using the uh, Excel function, so I need to make such type of the. Yeah, I calculated using yeah, Excel so. function, but in the exam you can't do that. No? Yeah, yeah, that's why. Now, can you please go to the second? Yeah, you guys can write the formula. Yeah. So the second one formula is this. Summation of y minus okay, sum into summation of x by n. Sir, if you can explain one, two, three, and four question. Three and four. Okay. So the first question. So we are given a data set, which is the amount of drug and then percentage of cell death. So here the amount of drug is our x or independent variable, and the percentage of cell death is our y or dependent variable. So here we are given to fit a regression equation and find the slope of the relation. So to find the slope of the relation, this is the formula that we use for linear regression. OK, here n is given as the number of data points that we have. In this case, n will be 6. So we have uh, terms summation of x, y, summation of x, summation of y, summation of x square, summation of x whole square. So we need to calculate all of these summations. So what we'll do is we'll plot first make a table. So we know the values for x and we know the values for y. We'll calculate the values for x, y. We'll multiply 30 into 10 is equal to 300, 32 into 14 is equal to 448, and so on. We calculate x square, which is 30 square, which is 900, 32 square, which is 1024, and so on. Then we'll sum all of these values. <coughs> so this column here will give us summation of x. This will give us summation of y. This is summation of xy. This is summation of x square. Then we'll put all these values in this equation to get the slope of the equation, the slope of the linear regression equation. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Understood. Yeah. In the second question, again, we have a formula. So D is the intercept, which is given by summation of y minus m into summation of x divided by n. So n, as we know, is 6. Summation of x and summation of y we calculated earlier in the table. And m value we calculated in the last question. m is the slope. So this m here is the slope. So we'll substitute all these values and we'll get the intercept value, which is minus 15 by 33. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, I understand. For R square, what we need to do is R square is given by 1 minus sum of square of residuals for sum of square regression value divided by total sum of squares. So we have X values, we have Y values, we can X1, X2 and so on, y1, y2, and so on. We'll calculate the mean for x and y first. Actually, we don't need the mean for x, so we'll calculate the mean for y. In this case, like sum all the y values and we'll divide by n, which turns out to be 20.66. Then what we'll do is we'll subtract y i minus y bar. So like each y value, y1 minus 20.67, y2 minus 20.67, this will do and get this column. Then this is nothing but the square of the last column, yi minus y bar whole square. 
So this is the squares of the differences. The sum of this column is given, uh, gives us the total sum of squares because we are subtracting the each value from the mean of the value. Okay. For this column, what we'll do is we have a regression equation based on the first two questions. We got the slope and the intercept for the regression line. We'll use these uh, this equation y is equal to mx plus b by substituting m and b for each of these x1, x2, x3, we'll get a predicted value of y. Okay, so this is our y predicted, which is y hat. Here, what we are doing is y i minus y hat. And here, this is y i minus y hat whole square. So this is the residuals. That is the difference between the actual value and the predicted value. And this is the square of it. We'll sum this to get the sum square of residuals. So R square is given by one minus sum square of residuals by total sum squares. So here, substituting these values, we'll get the value for R square, which is 0 0.9795. Is that clear? Sir, why I you got from why I? Sorry? Sir, why I you told why I? So for each of these values, yeah. we have y values, no? So for example, this one we have y value of 10, 14, 18, 22, 26, 34. So we have 10, 14, 18, 22, 26, 34, 26, 34. Okay, yi is nothing but this. So for this number of this data point, yi is 10, y bar is 20. So 10 minus 20.66 is minus 10.66. Then this is 14 minus 20.6, this is 6.66 and so on. For each of these rows, yi changes based on the data point we are taking. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah, yes, sir. And okay. Then for the fourth question, we have a formula. So using the R square value that we calculated earlier, we just put this formula 1 minus R square into N minus 1 by N minus P, whole thing 1 minus. So here N is the number of data points that we have, which is 6, and P is the number of parameters, which is 2. Because we have a linear regression equation, we have two parameters, slope and intercept. So this is uh, N is 6 and P is 2. We substitute all these values and we get our square adjusted value of 0.974. Is this is clear? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, bye. Thank you very much. Uh, for a total last seven weeks, you explained very well and hopefully all uh, get the benefit from your uh, lot, uh, your tut tut uh, I can say the uh, the way you presented us, uh, we understand all the such things and uh, implemented or understand in very well manner. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I go with Jagdish sir. Thank you very much for everything. So we have one more session next week. Uh, we are done with the assignment. So if you guys have any specific concepts that you are finding difficult or like any kind of specific questions that you would like to dis like me to discuss. Uh, if you guys could say something, then that would be nice. I can like uh, maybe add some questions related to those things. Like or discuss some of those concepts. So do you guys find anything particularly difficult in the course? Uh, if you explain something here, uh, for the benefit of uh, all the stakeholders, uh, yeah. in some uh, test, non-parametric test, p uh, p value is uh, similar to the parametric, but the tabulated value what we are seeing, that's a reverse uh, with respect to parametric test and non-parametric test. Okay, huh. so we are seeing less than and not greater than. Yeah. So I yeah. think uh, some people are aware about, but the benefit of all, if you explain one again, so that will be benefited in the exam actually. So basically for all parametric tests, we consider like if the value that we get, the Z value or the T statistic value or whatever, 
is greater than the table value for all parametric tests. For all non-parametric tests, we try to see the opposite. Uh, so we try to see if the value is less than the table value. That okay. is the clarification. Do you need why that is the case? Are you asking why? No, no, no. Uh, uh, they said based on the designer actually, but uh, somehow we are well versed with the parametric. So some people are confused at that particular time. So for Z test, T test, uh, and most of the other parametric tests, we will check if the statistic value that you calculate is greater than the critical value. For non-parametric tests like uh, Wilcox and rank some test or uh, man Whitney you test you check if the statistic value is less than equal to the critical value while checking the table also like uh, for just a warning like for these Man with Nego test and Wilcox and then some test. There are a lot of different kinds of tables available. So some of them have do some normalization and stuff. Uh, depending on how you calculate the statistics. So there are many different ways to calculate the statistic. I think the way you are taught for that, you will be given tables in the exam that are uh, like compatible with whatever formulas you are taught. But if you are using it in real life, be sure that uh, the tables that you are using are compatible with the kinds of statistics that you are calculating. Okay. That's okay. For, some, for example, like in some cases where you calculate the use statistic, what you do is you just get the sum of the uh, lowest rank. But in some cases, you divide that sum by the degrees of freedom or subtract it, something from it to get a different statistic. Both of these things are valid, but both of these things will need different tables. So that okay. is something you need to keep in mind while applying these tests in general. Yeah, thank you. Apart uh, from that, sir, uh, yeah. uh, some of the questions yeah. we got, we we need to calculate the so, matlab, uh, the answer from the table itself, like Wilcox Wilcox ranks uh, some table or uh, no, man witness U table, are uh, during the exam are the examiners or examination cells are going to provide us these ta those tables or how could we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you will be provided tables. Uh, okay, I joined late, uh, Arpit. Yeah, would yeah. you mind explaining from 5th, 6th, 7th? Just try to explain it. Uh, Arupi, sir, <coughs> can you start from 5th? Because I also joined on 720. Start from? Same. 5th question. 5th, okay. So, okay. Fourth, go to 4th yeah. once before coming. Uh, this is 4th. Yeah, yeah, please, please explain. Yeah, so basically in 3rd, what we did was we calculated the uh, R square value which is 1 minus sum of square of residuals divided by total sum of squares. This is how we get it. So for sum of squares, we take y a minus y bar whole square. For uh, sum of square of residuals, we take y a minus y predicted whole square. Then for adjusted r square, what we do is we take uh, like we take the r square value and we normalize it using the number of parameters in the equation that we are fitting. So basically, n here is number of data points that we have, which is 6. P here is number of parameters, which is two. We just substitute the calculated R square value from the last question in this equation, and we get a adjusted R square value of 0.9744. Okay. For the fifth question, what we need to do is we have this table. So six values we have for X and Y. In first case, what we'll do is to calculate uh, the so here what uh, predictive R square is 1 minus sum of predictive residuals by sum, total sum of squares. So predictive residuals uh, is something we get by building different linear models by excluding some data points. So here what we'll do is we'll exclude the first data point. We'll take data points 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, these all data points. 
will fit a model and will get an equation, which will be 2.4x minus 6, 3.6 in this case. Then what we'll do is we'll substitute the x value of the uh, thing that we had left out. So we had left out the first value, which is 30. We'll substitute this value to get a predicted y value for this model. Okay. So then again for the in, in the second case, we'll leave out the second value. We'll take one, three, four, five, six, all these other values. We'll fit a model, we'll get an equation, and then we'll substitute the x value for the second, the one that we left out. So by doing this for each of these points, when we leave point one, we get this equation. When we leave out point two, we get this equation and so on. We get six sets of equations. Then we'll substitute all these values. X is equal to 30, we'll substitute in this equation, we'll get the predicted value. X is equal to 32, we'll substitute in this equation, we'll get this predicted value. We'll get all these predicted mm -hmm. values. Then what we'll do is, so this is y print. This is y i minus y print. This is y i minus y print. Whole speed. We'll just calculate these columns. So this is nothing but this minus this. This is the square of this. Then we'll take the sum of this. So this is the sum of squares of predicted values, uh, residuals. Then we'll substitute this in the equation. And total sum of squares we know from the previous uh, calculation to be 373.333. And then we'll get a half square predicted value of 0.933. Is this clear? Yes, sir, clear, sir. Sir, what, yeah. sir, no, sir, I got confused, sir. Sir, can you go a little slow? Yeah, so in this case, what we have are six data points. One, two, three, four, five, six. So first, what we'll do is we'll leave out the first data point. We'll take all these other five data points. We'll fit a model. Okay, that equation will come out to be this. So like we did for the first and second questions, we'll calculate the slope, we'll calculate the intercept. That equation will come out to be this. Then what we'll okay, do is so the yeah. slope and intercept using those that slope and intercept we have to uh, generate in the form of y equals to mx plus c. Yeah. And we have to start with the second one. Yeah. So Means this data point we minutes. left out. Hmm? So while building the okay. model, we left out this data point. So then we'll put this data point back in and calculate the y value that we would have got. Okay, okay. so okay. Huh. Yes. That way we build it for all the different uh, rows. Yeah, so next question is how many degrees of freedom? So here the n is the number of data points is six. P is the number of parameters, which is two. So the degrees of freedom for error, which will be n minus p, which is four. In the next case, like what is the total sum of space? This we had calculated. So this is basically the formula. So for each point, we'll subtract it from the mean, we'll take the square and we'll sum all of it. We'll get the total sum of squares as 373.33. Okay. Sir, only sir, only for y value? Yeah, only for y value. Okay, all sir. of these things, whatever we are doing, total sum of squares, residuals, and all, we are all calculating for y values. When we calculate yes, the total sir. sum of squares, this is the formula. When we calculate the residual sum of squares, it is y i minus y hat whole square. Y hat. So y hat yes, is sir. the model y values. Great. For predictive yes. thing, we are doing y i minus y print whole square. So this is like. Uh, y value from new model. So we leave out that data point and calculate it back again. Okay. Then next question is of the factorial design is a design generator f is equal to ABCDE. What is the resolution? How many experiments we have to perform? And this is a two n power minus one design where n is dash. So first of all, we have five basic factors. So it's a two to the power five design, but we are replacing one factor. So it's two to the power five minus one. 
So this is the form of the equation. It's a half fractional of a uh, five factorial design. So here n will be five. Two power n minus one, n will be five. The number of experiments will be two to power five minus one, which is two to power four, which is sixteen. So in total, we'll have to perform sixteen experiments. The generator equation here will be f a b c d e. So we'll just remove the equal to from here. F a b c d e. And since this has six terms, F A B C D B, this resolution of this design is six. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And the next question is: We are given a factory is making switches every week. We take out eight samples, and the number of defects we are determining uh, to prepare an SPC chart. So, if we draw an SPC chart, what kind of chart will we draw? Since we are Calculating the number of defective pieces every week, and we have a constant number of samples that we are taking every week. This would be a C chart. If we had uh, been calculating the number of defective pieces, but we had differing number of samples. So one week we took out eight samples, one week we took out ten samples, and all. Then it would have been a U chart. For a P chart, what we do is we uh, we take out differing amount of samples every week, but the proportion of defective pieces is what we calculate, not the number of defective pieces. And for NP chart, we also again calculate the proportion of defective pieces, but we have a constant number of samples each month. Okay, so in this case, since we are having eight samples every week and we are creating the number of defects, so we can have a C chart. Is this clear? Yes, sir. The last question is given the data for the number of defects each week, so choose one of these options. So we plot this data as time goes by how many number of defective pieces we find. So we find the mean of the data, which is 4.2 somewhere around here. We'll find the upper control limit, which is mean plus three sigma, and the lower control limit, which is mean minus three sigma. Since this process falls inside the control limits, there are no consecutive points on one side, no like many consecutive points on one side, and it does not rapidly alternate between both the sides across the mean. We say that this process is in control. So there is no problem in this process, and hopefully everything is working. Okay. So in one of the videos, I had given a set of seven rules. You need to learn all those seven rules, and Try to plot these and see if one of those rules is violated. In that case, the process is not in control. And we need to check if there is no issue. Uh, Officer, can you repeat question six? Question? Six. Six. In this P, P is equal to two means M and B is, is if you counting yeah. two. Huh. Okay. Parameters. Okay, sir. Thank you. Maybe. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, if no one else has any doubts, we we'll stop here today. Hi, sir. Yeah. Hi. Uh, sir, uh, I have a question regarding the p value. Regarding? P value. Okay. Yeah. In general, actually, uh, I thought about the p value is. P value is a bigger concept and it takes a lot of time. But uh, as uh, um, starting in the field, how can we interpret it, uh, P value in terms of the level of significance and size and power testing and other things? So basically, in hypothesis testing, what we are doing is we have two samples. Okay. Yeah. We have a sample K. And we have a sample B. Okay, we have sample A and sample B. Here we have population A. And here we have population B. Yeah. Our null hypothesis is A is equal to B. B. Okay. okay. So null hypothesis, we always assume that these samples, sample A and sample B, come from the same population. That is, these distributions are not different. Both of these are overlapping distributions. OK, so this yeah. is a null hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis, both of these come from different uh, populations. 
Yes. Okay. So for all of the tests, what we calculate as P value is something that we set artificially. So basically what we are saying is we are assuming that we are dealing with population A and we want to know if population B is the same as population A or is it different? So we say that it, like based on the samples that we have collected, samples of A and samples of B, if we get a distribution of these samples or the values of the samples that we get fall after, so like, so we set an alpha value of, let's say 0 0.05. Okay. So basically what it does is, if the probability of us seeing these samples, given that both of these come from the same population is less than 0 0.05, it will assume that this does not belong to this sample. Yeah. So P value is basically the probability of seeing all these samples given that our null hypothesis is true. Yeah. P value is basically a probability kind of a thing. So what is the probability that I would have gotten these samples given that our null hypothesis is true? Mm -hmm. So when we get a P value that is less than the alpha value that we have set or the level of significance that we have set, we say that there is minimal chance that this came from the same population, that a null hypothesis is true. That's why we reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Okay. Basically, P value is like a probability and alpha or level of significance is something we have arbitrarily artificially set and we use that value to decide whether we say that our null hypothesis is true or is it false. Okay. So Sir, uh, an another thing is uh, the table value which are used in the non-parametric test. Uh, can we... Um, obtain this, those values from any software like Excel or uh, without standardize the uh, normal distribution, can we perform that? I am not sure about that. From Excel, I think you can get P values for non-parametric. Yeah, P value we get. Uh, then if you get P values and based on like the level of significance, you can directly say if something is uh, like you are rejecting the null hypothesis or accepting it. So you don't need to calculate the limit of the statistic. So in case you are using Excel or something, I would suggest use the p-values directly. Otherwise, yeah. you can take the charts so in one uh, of the videos. So another thing was, so since, so if these populations are not overlapping, so as our sample, so if you observe samples which have a very high probability of observance, they will fall somewhere in this region. Okay, so we can be pretty sure that they came from population A. So if our p-value is something like 0 0.97 or like 0 0.80 or something, and we can be sure that it came from population A. But if you have a p-value that is very small, let's say 0 0.001. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That means our uh, sample came from somewhere here. Okay. Yeah. That does not necessarily mean that the sample is from a different population. Okay. Yeah. It might just be the case that it is from this population and it has a very low chance of occurring, but we saw that even. Yeah. If the p value are uh, at the extreme point sometimes. Yeah. So based on the alpha value that we set, there are like two types of error that we can have. So, yeah. for example, like null hypothesis is really true, but we. Null hypothesis is really true, but we reject the null hypothesis. So this is an error. If null hypothesis is true and we accept it, this is okay. If null hypothesis is false and we reject it, it's okay. But if null hypothesis is false and we accept it, that is also an error. And if we null hypothesis is true and we reject it, that is also an error. So these uh, errors 
so this alpha value is a significance value there is something called a beta value for these tests which is a power so these the ratio of like alpha and beta value are kind of related so if we increase alpha beta decreases if you decrease alpha your beta increases so these are related to these errors so what they basically tell you is how good of a threshold are you setting so if a power of a test is very high then it can defect uh, it can detect very high like very minute differences between two populations but there's a higher chance that you will be making more of one of these errors and yeah. vice versa sir uh, yes. uh, we define power of the test as a uh, uh, reject h0 when h0 is false uh, can we uh, uh, define as accept h0 when uh, uh, H0 is true. Both are same or not? I don't think both are same. Just a second. And sometimes, sir, uh, uh, while testing the problems, if the no. uh, both test have the uh, same power. And mm -hmm. if uh, one of the test is having a uh, larger size than other, then which test is better? One of the test is having a larger? Uh, a larger size, alpha. Number of samples. No, no. Uh, there are two tests. Well, both have the same power. And if one of the uh, test is having larger alpha size, alpha value then other test then which test is better then i think you take the one with the smaller alpha value okay in that case you can be really sure mm -hmm. and sir uh, uh, while hypothesis may uh, formulating hypothesis the uh, which one is a uh, um, good uh, i uh, think there are some questions and uh, depend on question, we uh, define alternative hypothesis. Yeah. So, uh, but in uh, real problems, uh, how to define it? Uh, because I see uh, in some of the cases, if uh, the same data uh, is given, and if we uh, define the alternative hypothesis as A is less than B, and uh, yeah. if I perform the same test, uh, other uh, times also, if reject H0, then the both are uh, alternative are accepting. So which one is yeah. good? Actually? So for the purposes of the course, you need to look at the wording of the question. So yeah. if it says that, is there a difference or is, there, is A higher than B or A lower than B? In that yeah. case, like if higher and lower is mentioned, then you will use a one tail test. But if it says, yeah. is there a difference, then you should use a two tail test. But in your real life, if you are like very sure about something being different, then you should use a one tail test. For example, if you are checking the heights of like people in standard 11A and 11B, you have no reason to believe that these might be different, right? Or if there is like standard A, like uh, section A students are higher than section B students. So in that case, you will do a two tail test to check if there is a difference. But in the same case, if you are measuring heights of students from class 11 and students from class 5, you might have a natural idea that like 11 class students are probably taller than 5 class students. So what you'll do is you'll do a one tail test to see if one is greater than the other. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Pitpa, can you play uh, go to the factorial design question? Yeah. Hmm. A, B, C, C. Uh, even I have a doubt here. Uh, 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 actually, I repeat by, uh, as per my current understanding, this N is equal to 6. And this is a 2, N minus 1. This is a 2, 6 minus 1, 2 uh -huh, raised to 5. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. it should be like uh -huh. that. Huh? n is equal to 6. Mm, it would be n is equal to 6. Uh, so this will be 32, not 16. Thanks yeah. a lot, yeah. 
So total we have six factors and one we are assigning. So it's six minus one. Yeah. Yeah. My doubt is, how do you do the design generator? See, this is the slide. How do you do the design generator? Uh, it also needs to be. So one chapter lane. number chapter number 36 there you have there the uh, slap uh, time is 4.46 there they have shown a design generator uh, saying uh, 2 to the power of uh, 3 minus 1 is equal to 4 run c equals a b resolution is 3 similarly when you come for 2 to the power of 6 minus 2 5 minus 2 sorry 5 minus 2 number of runs is 8 the design generator is D equals AB and E equals AC. Resolution is 3. I want to know how he decided D equals AB, E equals AC. Okay. So in this case, like because I, I develop, I mean, I did my own. I, I could not upload it on the Excel sheet to share the screen. Uh, in next, next row, he has taken uh, 6 minus 1, 6 minus 2, 6 minus 3, 32, 16, and 8 runs. F equals this same thing, F equals A, B, C, D, E. E equals A, B, C, F equals A, C, D. How did you decide that? I want to know. Three runs, two runs, how is it decided? So if you have a design like 2 to the power 5 minus 2, so you calculate this. 2 to the power 5 minus 4 is 2 to the power 3. So this will be 8. So in total, we'll have 8 runs. Okay, for this fraction factorial design. And since the base design comes to 2 to power 3. We'll build a base design of using three factors that is A, B, C, A, B, A, C, B, C, B, C. Last one is A, B, C, I think. Uh, last one is A, B, C. All of these. Okay. Then what we'll do since we have two more factors to add, so in total we have five factors, we'll start substituting. And while substituting, what we'll do is we'll first try to substitute the highest order terms. So because when we run an experiment, usually it's uh, mostly we'll find main effects or two effect interactions. Three effect or more interactions are very rare. Yeah. So these are generally don't occur naturally in experiments. So what we are doing is we are replacing this by just say D. And then we have to replace another one by E. Since these are main effects, we'll replace one of these as E. So this is the final design. So we have, for example, this as plus, plus, plus. No, no, that is plus. fine, 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 sir. I understood that. I am not able to get how you decided ABC, ABC and AB, AC, BC. If that line, I'm this I this I solved it. How you design generator? You decide two minus. 5 minus 2 is 3. Uh -huh. Correct. From there you start. ABC is 3 factors. Yeah, ABC is 3 factors. Okay. So the full factorial table for ABC is ABC, AB, AC, BC, ABC. Okay. Now how is that decided? Full factorial is like that. Mid full factorial means all the main effects and all the interaction terms. Taking 2 at a time, 3 at a time, 4 at a time. That's okay. the definition. Mm -hmm. For example, if we have A, B, C, D, then ah. the full factorial will be A, B, C, D, A, B, A, C, A, D, B, C, B, D, okay. C, D, A, B, C, B, C, D, A, C, D, and all till A, B, C, D. All okay. of these will be in the full factorial. Hmm. Now you notice since we have three factors, root hmm. by three is eight, we have eight runs here. Okay. Three, four, five. In total, we have eight runs for Please. this experiment. Plus minus plus minus eight values. Mm. OK. Then to make it fractional factorial, we'll just replace these terms by new factors. So ABC will replace by D and either any of these three will replace by E. That I understood, sir. That is not an issue. One step behind you, you go take another uh, sum, I will tell. Six, uh, two to the power of six minus one. For that, you please show me design. 2 to power 6 minus 1. So this is 2 to power 5. 32. So we'll have a base design of 2 to power 5, which is 5 factors. Yeah. So we'll have A, B, C, D, E. Then we have A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E. 
BC, BD, BE. Okay. okay, this I understood. Next line. The, the land, it's A, B, C, D, E. Oh, okay. Huh. All of these will have. All hmm. the three factorial terms like A, B, C, B, C, D, and ah, A, I B, C, D. Huh. Huh. Okay, you got that. Yeah. Then we need to introduce one new factor. Okay. The highest order term is what we'll go for. So A, B, C, D, E will be replaced by. We have yeah. to only introduce one factor because it is subtracted by one. Yeah. If it is subtracted by two, we have to introduce two new factors. Yeah. That is the, uh, if it is subtracted by three, three. Three new factors. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So one next, my next question is, uh, see, one you subtract, it is half. Hmm. Two you subtract, it is one fourth. Hmm. Three you subtract, it is one eighth. Hmm. Four you subtract, it is one sixteenth. Yeah. Okay. It is just for my understanding, sir. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Because right? when we subtract one, like the full factorial for two to power six will have hmm. sixty four experiments. Yes, yes, when we subtract one, we are doing thirty two. So this is half of the experiments. Yeah, yeah, correct. If we write two to power six minus two, we'll do sixteen experiments, which hmm, is one is fourth. Yeah, correct, correct. Of sixty four. Of sixty four. Correct. And yeah. so on. Yes, yeah, I got it, sir. Yeah. I Thanks, sir. Please answer for this two level. Ashish, bhai, am hmm. I right? Here Sorry. we are using two level. That's why this is the correct answer. But if anyone raised the question for the three level, that might be a different answer. What might be a different answer? Two raised to five. Uh, if in place of that, three raised to five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, then, then that's a different answer. Levels. Yeah. Two is basically the number of levels, like yeah. plus minus is plus is one level and minus is one level. If we have like three to the power two design or three to the power three design, then we have three levels, plus, minus, and zero. So uh, the restriction. Sorry. So can you? So can oh, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so Resolution for two power six minus one experiment is five, isn't it? Resolution for two power six minus one will be five. Six. No, it, it will be six. This is two power six minus one that we have calculated. The resolution will be five, right? Should be six. How? How, uh, how huh. so we are using this we are substituting this right a b c d e as f so this is the equation f is equal to a b c d e the generator equation will be f a b c d e we'll just remove the equal to mm. since this has six terms it will have a resolution of six Resolution is basically the minimum number of terms that the design generator has. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. In this it case, is... which is 2 to the power 5 minus 2, we have design generator D is equal to ABC and also we have E is equal to BC. Okay, so the design generator I here will be DABC is equal to EBC. Since EBC is the smaller one here, which has three terms, the resolution of this whole design is three. So resolution three design, not a resolution four design because we take the minimum. In this case, this will be the minimum. Whatever substitutions and multiplications you make, the minimum term will always have six terms. Okay. So can we say that resolution is the fact uh, n number of factors or parameters taken? Mm. Hmm? Mm. Sir, uh, one resolution question. will depend on your design. Sir, Mama. sir, can I have one question? How would yeah, yeah. we decide that this equation is for two level or three level? Like it was for 
f is equals to a b c d e then how would we decide that this is a two level equation or we need to calculate it for three level equation for the purpose of the course any of the factorial questions that will come will mostly be two level questions you don't need to decide about three levels uh, if you are provided with a three level question then it will explicitly mention that it's a three level question okay in general, you assume it's always level two. Archana, ma'am, uh, sir, uh, may pardon me if I uh, explain yes. uh, the the please. resolution pattern. Please, please, please. Uh, Archana, ma'am, so that she can uh, what uh, trick please. I had used, she and that will be helpful for her. Her actually, if you allow me. Uh, I couldn't hear you. The trick that you had was, I had I had made it a, a, my own trick. Uh, Doble sir had showed a table. From that mm. table, I had made it my own uh, tricks so that it will be easier to understand the how many resolution it will take and how many number of uh, experiments we are going to take or how many uh, interpretations we are going to do in that particular design generation. If you allow me, then I can uh, explain her so that uh, she could understand yes, yes, better. Yes. I think I think I could do that. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to share I, something? Actually, do you want to share yes, your sir. screen? Sir, but uh, I don't know how to share my screen actually right now. There is a three dots from where show device mm -hmm. setting, show meeting details. No, there should be something near your camera and my saying uh, share screen. Camera and a open share tray. Open share tray. Open. Share tray. Uh, I couldn't hear you. Open. There is a open share tray. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's drop the window. Uh, is it visible to all? Yeah. Uh, can I go with the some part with the Hindi as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. आप यहाँ पे देखो design दिया two to जैसे प्रकाश सर ने भी बोला था और मोहम्मद सर ने भी बोला था कि if it is minus one, three in the power it is minus one. Then directly हमको लिखना है resolution जैसे two to the power first इन्होंने लिखा है. थ्री माइनस वन तो हमें डायरेक्टली थ्री लिखना है अगर वहां पे फाइव माइनस वन है देन इट विल डायरेक्टली फाइव अगर सिक्स माइनस वन है इट रिजोल्यूशन विल बी डायरेक्टली फाइव सेकेंड थिंग हमें ये ध्यान रखनी है अगर यहाँ पे टू टू दी पावर थ्री माइनस वन सपोज फर्स्ट लाइन हमने ली तो यहाँ पे थ्री रिजोल्यूशन है वो अगर हम नहीं भी देखते हैं तो टू टू दी पावर थ्री है यानी हमें थ्री फैक्टर्स लेने सी ए बी सी और यहाँ पे इन्होंने माइनस वन लिखा है मतलब हमारा जो भी डिजाइन जनरेशन होगा उसमें हम कोई एक ही चीज सब्सटीट्यूट कर रहे हैं और हमारा जो एक सब्सटीट्यूशन है वो एक है ठीक है दूसरा है जैसे फाइव टू दी पावर टू पे आप आ जाओ तो यहाँ पे सीधा सा है कि अगर वन से हट करके टू थ्री फोर कुछ भी आता है माइनस में तो okay. हमें उसका जो भी डिफरेंस है जैसे फाइव माइनस टू इज इक्वल टू थ्री तो हमें यहाँ पे रिजोल्यूशन थ्री कर देना है और बीच में जो है हमें थ्री थ्री फैक्टर्स के बनाने हैं तो जब हम थ्री थ्री फैक्टर्स के डिजाइन जनरेशन बनाएंगे तो ऑब्वियस सी बात है कि डी बराबर ए बी हो जाएगा ई e बराबर ए सी होगा और ये कैसे कन्फर्म होगा कि हम कितने बना रहे हैं यहाँ फाइव टू की पावर माइनस लिखा है तो जो ये टू okay. लिखा है इसका मतलब हमारे हमें दो सब्सटीट्यूट करने हैं तो अगर है। हम किन्हीं पांच चीजों से दो चीजें सब्सटीट्यूट कर रहे हैं तो हमारे बाकी सिर्फ तीन जो है बच रहे हैं तो टोटल में हमने फाइव लिया ए बी ए वन बी टू सी थ्री डी फोर एंड ई फाइव टोटल हमारे फाइव हो गए जैसे कि टू टू दी पावर फाइव है तो डिजाइन जनरेटर में हमारे फाइव कम्पोनेंट आएंगे ए बी सी डी ई वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव और हमने यहाँ से टू माइनस करना है इसका मतलब हमें इनको इस तरह से डिवाइड करना है कि ये दो ही फ्रैक्शंस में बटे तो दो okay. डिजाइन में बटे 
और हुँ. तीसरा है हमारा कॉन्सेप्ट की ये थ्री रिजोल्यूशन है मतलब हमारा इक्वेशन जो जा रहा है वो थ्री का इसके जस्ट ऊपर देखो आप फाइव माइनस वन है और कुछ भी सब्सटीट्यूट नहीं करना जान में जैसे लास्ट में आप देखो टू टू दावर सिक्स माइनस थ्री है तो जब हम बेसिस पे चलेंगे तो यानी हमें कोई तीन चीजें या थ्री थ्री जो डिजाइन है उनमें कोई थ्री वैल्यूज है उनको डिसलोकेट करना है और सिक्स माइनस थ्री है मतलब थ्री रिजोल्यूशन होगा क्योंकि यहाँ लास्ट में थ्री है तो हमने उसका डिफरेंस निकाला हमारा रिजोल्यूशन थ्री आया और जब भी थ्री रिजोल्यूशन होगा तो जैसे सी इज इक्वल टू ए बी वैसे ही डी इज इक्वल टू ए बी ई इज इक्वल टू और एफ इज इक्वल टू सी और यहाँ पे लास्ट में जितने भी माइनस में है मतलब okay. हमें उतने ही ऑर्डर्स निकालने हैं इधर बीच में डिजाइन जनरेटर में तो ये आई थिंक बहुत इजी वे था मुझे इसको मतलब याद करने के लिए थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू सो मच आई विल गो थ्रू द यूट्यूब अगेन मैं फिर फिर से एक बार पूरा ट्राई करूंगी इफ देयर इज एनीथिंग आई टेक्स्ट मैंने कुछ भी नहीं बताया है बट इसको जब मैंने बहुत क्लियर उसको बहुत ध्यान से देखा ना तो मुझे हाँ. यही ट्रिक समझ में आई कि ये एक ये ऐसी ट्रिक है इसके थ्रू अगर हम लोग याद करेंगे तो हाँ. बहुत सारे क्वेश्चंस के आंसर हमें मिल जाएंगे ये हाँ. हमारा सेवेंथ वीक का लास्ट का हाँ. एक लास्ट वो है वीडियो है और उसका थर्टी मतलब मिनट्स पे शुरू होगा ये वीडियो सही बात है थैंक यू बाकी लोगों को भी समझ में आ गया हो तो बहुत अच्छा है मुझे लगेगा कि मतलब शायद बहुत लोगों को क्योंकि मुझे लास्ट जब सिक्स मंथ में अर्पित सर ने डिस्कस किया था मैं बहुत कंफ्यूज थी क्वेश्चन नंबर टू में इवन आई हैड आस्ड हिम फॉर द टू और थ्री टाइम कि सर इसको जल्दी से जल्दी अपलोड करिए ताकि हम समझ सके फिर मैं बापा से गोथ रू हुई तो मुझे ये लगा की ये ट्रिक बहुत ईजी है याद करने के लिए You went out of your way to teach me. I'm so happy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was very Thank kind you, of you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's it's a pleasure for from Alvita that he has allowed me to guide yeah, yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. So that. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Assignment six, question one. On. Question number. Degrees of freedom. No, no, no. Assignment six. Sorry. Abhi bhai, you are still in your school. Assign. Question one. Assign six. Week, Assign week six. Week six. Week. Okay. Question one. Only. Arpit sir, on personal reasons, I am leaving. Thank you. Yeah, Maybe yeah. I'll catch up next. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Assignment number six, question number one. Yeah, on exponential distribution. Yeah, in that case, like uh, here, what we are doing is uh, since it's an eight-hour time period, mm. when we have forty patients to visit, we'll get the mean number of patients by eight by forty mm. that we visit every hour. That will use as the mean for the exponential distribution, and we'll calculate mm. probability. We'll put the direct formula into a minus lambda x. Yeah, but the lambda is the rate, right? And I think the question itself is wrong because it says on a particular. That's what I feel also. Day. But the way they have calculated is different. And I talked to the other Tiamir also, and he told me for uh, this part, I think they have. Ordered it very differently, but that is how you get the answer. Can you please yeah. uh, to the? Because the way I explained this question was very different from the way they have done it, and I was not sure about it then. No, because the exponential factor is a dimensionless quantity, right? That's what I thought. That's why I took the rate. I took one minus mu, but uh, they have not taken as one minus mu. No other. Day, um, my uh, thing is, yeah, I think uh, the both the solution and the uh, question itself is wrong, because the exponential distribution says 
the decay starts from time t equals zero. So it has um, a mean time associated with it right from start t equals zero. There is a probability associated with the first two hours. So it can it can only be zero only below time t equals zero. It can only be zero below t equals zero. The exponential distribution is defined as. Uh, I understand that. I also feel that this question is worded very weirdly, and we should take one minus mu, which is a dimensionless quantity here. But, but they have be. not done that in the course. I was not very sure about what they did. That's why I told you guys to follow what Amir will say in his lecture. But the, this is the solution is wrong. The question is also. Yeah. The, the solution will come if you calculate it their way, if you put it actually, as mean I, and not uh, rate. Dayatri, ma'am, actually, they have calculated the value based on the video uh, of the tu uh, tuition material provided. There, there is a mistake, actually. I agree with her, but uh, somehow they have followed that uh, video tutorial material only. Yeah. And yeah. same discussion was also held during the discussion point, and I raised the same at that particular time. Yeah. The question is wrong, sir. And I, I think this needs See, to the be. The thing right. is, I cannot do anything about wrong questions and all. So the last mail I wrote, they replied to me saying that students have to provide feedback on questions and they will uh, change whatever they have to change. Uh, the solution so, is also wrong. Yeah, so you can write that in the feedback. Uh, I have sent there is a feedback. I have sent an email in the discussion forum. Yeah, email I think they won't reply to. For my email, they took two weeks to reply, and then they were like, "Yeah, students to fill out the feedback form." Oh, okay. okay. So like, it's uh, because they question, have a lot of emails from a lot of people. But I had made it a feedback as well for the question number uh, seven of week seven. But they even though did not reply to me anything related uh, to that. So because that question people, doesn't say ki it belongs to the question four or five, the table given above it. It says ki we uh, the other non-parametric test we could be, do is some was uh, will Coxon sign test, sign yeah, test, yeah, or to solve test another. Yeah, but the they, didn't yeah. but yeah. they didn't have replied. Yeah. But they didn't have replied yet to me, sir. Yeah. So these are things like if you guys write about it in a group, I think they will surely notice. So for questions like the rounding of error and the other exponential distribution and all, if you guys write, uh, many of you write the same feedback, they will consider it. In this case, I'm not sure because I think most of the other people have assumed that it comes from the same question and answer similarly. And, and aside... Just... Yeah. Assignment three, uh, question one needs to be uh, upgraded. The answer was wrong. Yeah, again, you have to write it to them, fill the feedback form. If enough of you feel that a question is wrong, then they will uh, do it. For the past courses also, when they feel that a question answer is wrong or a question is wrong, they have given grace marks to people. For that, you need to fill the feedback, feedback form. So, uh, what I am saying is, uh, it's been quite a few weeks since that happened. We have discussed that in the forum, but I don't think it has been upgraded so far. They won't update it now. They will update it mostly after the course ends while they're calculating your marks. Okay, okay. All right. But I, six, um, question one also needs to be. Yeah, again, fill the feedback for you, what I can say. I think it's not a, because I think everybody. Uh, <laughs> so when you feel fill these feedback forms, they'll finally take a look at it near your exams or after your exams, and then they'll do all these things. Okay. Because they have to manage a lot of courses, so they can't do this for every course for every week. So you are uh, about to explain why for non-parametric test it is less than the table value. Why is something that I don't know really that I have to look up. That's why I asked, do you want to know why? 
because I thought I'll think about it and uh, answer in the next class. But I know like for non parametric tests, you look at less than values, and for parametric tests, you look at greater than values. Okay. Uh, most of these things are like very mathematical and uh, they depend on the statistic you calculate and the way you calculate it and the equations you use to calculate it. So a lot of it will boil down to basic maths. So maybe somewhere someone took minimum instead of maximum and that has been the norm. Probably some reason like that would be something that will turn out. I'll anyways look for it. Uh, next week, if possible, I'll find I'll share it. Okay, so thank you. I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, the Yates correction. Sorry? Yates correction. Uh, I can't hear you. Why Yates? Yates correction. correction, okay. Huh. When do we use it and when do we not? Just a second, let me remember. I think you use it when you have smaller values, right? Uh, this was uh, that's best, right? As a non continuous data at that particular Ice time, this state correction is required to do. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, non continuous data is there. The, huh. Then the, its correction is required to apply. What I understand from that lecture. Uh, might be. Might be. I'm not really sure right now. I'll get back. Yeah, but that's this. this uh, what I said at the uh, uh, speakers is and uh, explain that. Sorry. A speaker explained that in the video. So huh. Gayatri ji, you can refer that video. That's information yeah. is available. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we'll meet next week and I'll try to clear these doubts. Uh, and anything else thank that you guys might have finally. Yeah, thanks.